Alrighty, so now let's take a look at the headlines that are making a splash on the front pages of today's newspapers. If you join me, uh, I bet you have the papers as well now, don't of you? Of course I do. <laughs> Grand. Going to be starting from the Daily Trust newspaper this morning. The headlines that meet you when you pick up a copy of the Daily Trust news headline uh, newspaper. Inside Benway's unending militia war, how it started, uh, festered. Uh, bad boys issued, uh, used or rather dumped by politicians, and uh, Ghana's vacuum and leadership tussle. Governor Ayer's doors still open for amnesty, media aid says. At the top of the Daily Trust, Kanye Wood bids farewell to veteran actress Dasso, and Naira could trade below 1,000 Naira to the dollar. Goldman Sachs predicts, well, I can't wait, please trust me. <laughs> Tell me when it hits 350. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's what it is I remember. good news because everyone was predicting at the time that it was going to increase or the price was going to hike all the way to 2,000 naira. Well, didn't it already? It kind of like did. <laughs> Goodness right, me. What paper do you have this morning? <laughs> uh, let's move on now to Punch newspaper, shall we? And the very first headline that jumps at you is how I collected $3 million in cash for a Mephele dispatch rider tells court. Now he goes on to explain how he picked up $1 million dollars $850,000, $750,000, as well as $450,000 for ex-CBN governor. Says MFLA never rewarded him. Case adjoined till April 19th. It's a very interesting story that you should read it actually because this guy claims that he started out as just a dispatch writer and then went on to become his confidant, let's put it that way. And it's very interesting when you read this from the um, copy of the Punch newspaper. Perhaps maybe you should take that one um, this morning. There are other headlines on here as well. What else do we have, or do you want me to continue? FG traces fleeing Binan's executive to Kenya. Interpol EFCC commands extradition. FBI on red alert. And at the very top, mixed reaction trails Bobriski's six months prison sentence. You're so excited for am, this story. I'm sorry if, if my passion is showing, but <laughs> it, it is, uh, it's a very interesting story because everybody had a bit of interest in it considering the way it's uh, followed through since after his very flamboyant e uh, expressions of the but, Naira. Let's yeah, so. but let's not pretend that uh, spreading or spraying Naira is not part of our culture in and of itself. So much so that there are other cultures that are now adopting the culture as well. Mm. Copy so the good things, not the bad ones. Uh, there's also a uh, story there. Junior Pope, ill-fated movie producer, risks ban, says DGN president. In fact, I hear that he has already been banned. There's been certain bans put on him. Yes. Uh, so he can't and then if you check right at the now. bottom of the newspaper there, you see uh, about the Dosumu market fire. Facing on certain future Dosumu market fire, victims count losses in hard times. And of course, at the very last line there, seven drown in Lagos within a week, says PPRO. You can find all that on Saturday's uh, Punch uh, newspaper. Away from that now, we move on to the Guardian newspaper. And the very first one that jumps out of you from the page two is Rampus in Tunubus, Lagos, ahead of Kansu Polls. Mm, interesting, mm -hmm. that one, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, also on the front page for the Guardian, a new national ID card to be issued through banks, says NIMC. What happens to all the others, I ask, and everything that we've been or they've touted since regarding our identification and all? But well, this is supposed to replace everything, is what they say. Well, we'll just wait and see. How I collected three million naira cash from Mimifiele makes another return. It's iteration here for The Guardian. At the top of The Guardian, showcasing women who are breaking glass ceilings, inspiring others. We have one right here, Judith Atibi. Yay! Uh, woohoo! There's and, also a story on Okwama. Okwama, yeah. 17, military arrest, three community leaders, uh, recover assorted arms and speedboats. And that's on the page three of The Guardian newspaper. We're going to be take, talking more on mm. uh, Okwama and the community as Very well many concerns inside there. of our big story. Yeah. So you want to look out for that one. Saturday Tribune now. CBN workers, uh, worker tells court, I collected three million cash for, um, uh, for MFLA. It's the big story today. Everybody seems to be talking about this one. And at the top, another touch on the Bobriski instance. And I took over five, uh, 500 anti-TB tablets, over 600 injectable drugs in eight months. And police parade self-kidnapper, others in Delta State. And gunmen attack channels. TV reporter in Rivers demand 30 million. Now, that was a very sad story from yesterday. It's so sad. And it's very unfortunate that up until now, we still have situations such as this, where there are crimes and lives of a journalist who are supposed to be bringing the news and doing the job and being at the line of work and constantly uh, being uh, attacked. We're the target you know, just now. Just the targets. It's, it's unfortunate. I do hope that uh, my, our heart goes out to, of course, they're part of 
uh, the the ecosystem and of course the the uh, the the industry. Mm -hmm. Our heart goes out to uh, oh, we'll to the up team on that there. Story we hope that, that uh, they gets, get rescued. Yes, he gets indeed. rescued in no time. Can we move on now to the Saturday Independent? I'm going to take just a few headlines from there because it's rocking with headlines this morning. More Knox Trail FG's electricity tariff hike. Infrastructure outdated. Can't meet growing demand, industrialists say. Government policy favors World Bank, that's the IMF, and uh, says the NLC. And new tariff for banned A customers appropriate for sector's growth, says energy experts. We'll talk about that one plenty inside of Breakfast Extra. Gunman abducts Channel's TV reporters once again for the Saturday Independence and Naira views Bobriski to spend six months in jail. No without vacancy. Without option of fine. Without. We should mention that actually. Yeah, without option of fine. Mm. <laughs> no we... vacancy in under government house boasts Governor Aida Tiwa. I'm shocked. I'll shock you. Uh, Jim Ibrahim brags. It's mm. a back and forth in on the state. And so finally, we take the nation uh, this Saturday. Of course, the very story of the CBN employee says, I collect how I collected three million naira, rather, three million dollars mm. for MFLA by CBN employee. Former Apex Bank boss gets 50 million naira bill. And of course, at the bottom uh, right there, you see another headline that's Bobriski jailed six months for naira abuse. And it goes on, there's a small connotation there that says, I am a man, cross-dresser, cross tells court. And at the bottom of the <laughs> newspaper there, Kingmakers endorse Ola Kunlei as 43rd Olu Badon. And at the top of the right of the nation, you'd see uh, economy will roll back in coming months. And that's from Tunumbu. The connotation there is charges uh, government NAS to work with him to make Nigeria greater. And on the Naira, see on the Naira, everyone's eyes now seem to be on Nigeria Naira. Goldman Sachs predicts sub 1,000 Naira to a dollar exchange rate, says, says uh, currency outperforming others globally. Mm. Mm. Last paper for today, Saturday Vanguard. ICPC toothless bulldog fails to prosecute suspects, it's uh, reports indicted. Uh, shocking, no indicted persons held accountable, Eze Onyek Bere says, and governor must urgently develop strategy to address corruption. Okoma killings, why we won't participate in military investigations, say the Urobo Youths, and it's a very interesting instance here telling that the military has no right to investigate itself. It should be an independent investigation is what they say. Um, we'll also talk about that uh, shortly. And Ulubada, kingmakers present Olakulehi for coronation. And, of course, all the other stories that we touched on from all the other dailies also make a return here for the, the Saturday Vanguard. But that's all we have for yeah. the dailies this morning. And those are... And those are the stories making headlines on the front pages of the dailies this Saturday morning. Now we want you to stay tuned as some of these stories might have origins from the big stories as we'll, as we'll be discussing uh, them this morning on Breakfast Extra. And now that you have all gone through the entire uh, dailies, mm -hmm. all right, let's get you caught up on some of the on big catch up. stories. <laughs> Welcome back. So it so happens that throughout the week, we've been closely monitoring events that really stood out. Now, let's take a closer look at the stories that deserve a second look here on Breakfast Extra. It's time to play what we call catch up. Mm. My favorites. Now, <laughs> coming up, let's talk about the alleged abuse of office for former CBN governor Emifiele. He's been granted gil, uh, bill. Now, on Friday, April 12th, Nigeria's former um, central bank governor Godwin Emifiele was granted bill in the sum of 50 million naira after being charged with a 26 count bordering on alleged abuse of office and irregular allocation of $4.5 billion and $2.8 billion naira, respectively. Emifiele was admitted to bail with two shorties in like sum by Justice Ramon Oshudi, the judge in his ruling. On the bill application on Friday, admitted MFLA on bill with two shorties in like sum. Now, it will be recalled that the um, Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC, had on April 8th arraigned MFLA and his co defendant, Henry Isioma Omoile. And we move on now to Edo politics, where the impeached Deputy Governor Schwab has now filed a formal petition against the Chief Judge. 
Now, this happened on Wednesday, April 10th, where the impeached uh, Deputy Governor of Edo State wrote to the Chief Justice of Nigeria, and that's Justice Ulukayo de Ariwola, to obtain a complaint form to file a former petition against the Chief George of Edo, and that's Justice Daniel Okoboa. Now, Shabi was impeached on Monday the 8th by the State House of Assembly following the adoption of the report of a seven-man panel set up by the chief judge to probe him for alleged perjury and leaking the government's secrets. Hmm. And we have more what moving on to the... secrets are. Yeah, well, we'll find out <laughs> eventually. Moving on to the Labour Party now, the crisis rocking the NLC as they sack a bure. Um, the political commission of the Nigeria Labour Congress has voided the national convention that turned Julius Abure as the national chairman of the Labour Party and also the National Working Committee of the party. The commission also agreed to set up a transition committee to manage the affairs of the party in the interim. Mm. Now, the commission took the decision in a communique at the end of a one-day stakeholders meeting in Abuja, attended by some members of the Labour Party, chairman of the political commission from the 36 states and FCT, as well as founding fathers of the party. And now, we'll move away from that now to talk about the Lagos market blaze, and that's the fire that raised part uh, sections of Idu Motor Market. Now, this happened on Tuesday, April 9th, uh, where fire got at parts of a popular section of Lagos Island Idumota Market. Now, the fire was due to a generator explosion, and one of the gutted buildings caved in as firemen battled to extinguish the inferno. No life was reported lost in the incident, thank goodness, but goods worth millions of naira were destroyed. The Lagos State Governor Baba J. Sonwulu ordered the immediate and indefinite closure of the Dosumu Market on Lagos Island. Later on the show, uh, our correspondent was, uh, who was on the ground to report the fire will be joining us live to discuss the incident and also much more. Oh, yes, indeed. Talking about incidents now, we were also will stay in Lagos, and that is the commercial capital of Nigeria, where a bus accident took place and 18, 18 people were injured in a long crash on the newly refurbished and opened third mainland bridge and this happened on wednesday april 10th where the lagos state traffic management authority rescued 18 injured accident victims at adekunle inward adeniji adele on third mainland bridge lagos the director of public affairs and enlightenment department of lasma at the biotal fic disclosed that 18 seriously seriously injured passengers were rescued by lasma officials from zone i think zone a lagos island our preliminary investigations revealed that a fully loaded lt commercial bus lost control and almost fell over into the lagoon before it was stopped by the rails. Very sad incident there. And still on more sad news is the death of uh, Nollywood actor Junior Pope. And now the Actor Guild of Nigeria suspended uh, movies with both rides. And this happened on Thursday, April 11th, where the Actor Guild of Nigeria stopped all film productions involving River Rhine areas and boat rides following the tragic boat accident that claimed the life of Nollywood actor Junior Pope and three crew members on Wednesday, April 10th. Now, additionally, actors have been barred from participating in any film produced by Adama Luke, the producer of the movie The Other Side of Life, in which Juno Pope starred before his death. Meanwhile, yesterday, Friday, April 12th, the Marine Police of Anambra State Command recovered the bodies of the three remaining victims of the unfortunate boat accident. Uh, may their very souls rest in perfect peace. Very, very you. sad incident there. It's just uh, heartbreaking to mm. see how... You're on the job and somehow you just... Especially when you're passionate about something. Exactly, especially very, very when you're passionate about it. Mm. And now we are our last story for today. We've already heard about this. Nigeria's former Minister of Science and Technology, Dr. Ogbonaya Onu, on the Amadu, Amadu, uh, Amadu Buhari, Muhammadu Buhari's administration passed away now this week. Now Onu, a former governor of Abia State, died on Thursday after a brief illness in an undisclosed hospital in Nigeria. Now, if you recall that the late 72-year-old former minister contested for the presidential flag of the All Progressives Congress during the 2023 general election, but lost to President Bola Tunumbu. Well, indeed. Now, that's as much as we can take inside of our catch-up segment, but want to let you know that if you stick around, we have the big stories. And inside the big stories, we're going to be talking about the Edo instance and everything that's happening with the Edo politics. We will be joined by our guests. We have with us the publisher of the Niche newspaper, and that is Mr. Ikechuku Amechi. And also, I uh, will be joined by Mr. Sam Kagbo. Uh, they will be joining us uh, for that conversation. So let's take a quick break, and when we get back, we'll get straight into our big story for today.
I always just wonder whether the breakfast ever had anything inside of their cups. But no, you want to try it? Mm. Is there something in there? <laughs> at least we've got some good coffee here. Very refreshing. Welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. Now we're going to be taking a critical look at some of those stories, um, especially the one from Edo State. Uh, uh, the state of confusion, if you want to call it that way. And uh, that's uh, the uh, impeachment of the Deputy Governor Schreibel. That's Philip Schreibel. Uh, that's our big story one. And we have a guest here with us, but we're going to be talking with him um, about this instance. In Edo State, on Monday the 8th, uh, the State House of Assembly impeached the embattled Deputy Governor, Comrade Philip Schreibel. The decision came following the adoption of the report of a seven-man investigative panel set up by the Assembly to probe allegations of misconduct against Schreibel. Now, the impeachment proceedings culminated in a dramatic vote that saw Schreibel ousted from his position and saw the swearing-in of 38-year-old Omobai Omavlos Godwins, we made a joke about that earlier, as the new deputy governor. And joining us now to discuss this matter further are Ikechuku Amechi. He's the publisher of the Niche newspaper and Mr. Sam Kabo San. And he joins us live uh, via internet. Welcome, gentlemen, and many thanks for coming on. We really appreciate you for coming on, sirs. Always Good night, my guys. pleasure. So, uh, first of all, Ikechuku, let me ask you, let me start from you. Um, let's get your individual takes, both of you actually, on the way the matter unfolded all through the week, especially concerning the immediate swearing in of the deputy governor. Many would say that the case of uh, calling, is a case of calling a dog a bad name so that you can hang it. So, Mr. Ikechuku, let's start with you, please. Well, I've, I've uh, spoken on this Edo, Edo issue. Uh, well, but first of all, let me also say, Hello to my friend, Sam Cabo. Uh, I've not seen him in a very, very, very long while. So, Sam, you're welcome. Thank you very much. I should also say, uh, I should also say uh, you guys are welcome for facilitating this reunion. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. You know, the last time we were at uh, Delhi Independent, you know, and I've been asking after him. I'm hopeful that after this program, I will have his number. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, yes. well, um, it will come at a cost because mm. this, this was a very expensive I don't mind. I don't reunion mind. I don't that mind. was done at my expense. Yes, that, uh, Sam, definitely you get the number. Uh, uh, Sam was <laughs> on our editorial board and when I was editor of Daily Independent Newspaper. Mm. Uh, so, my pleasure. Uh, like Thank I said earlier. You guys. Well, so, go back, if, if we go back to the Edo issue, look, um, I think last week on this very platform also, I was saying that my problem is what to do with the position of deputy governors in this, in this country. Look, there was a report last week that about 17 or so deputy governors have been impeached since the uh, commencement of the Fourth Republic, which was 1999. If you look at those 17 deputy governors that were impeached, almost all of them, almost all of them, all the impeachments were instigated by their, by their principals, mm -hmm. the governors. So how is it easy that a governor wakes up in the morning, does not like the face of the same man? Mm -hmm. Don't forget that this is a joint ticket. And he gets the State House of Assembly to impeach on gross misconduct, whatever that Which we don't know what exactly is, it might be. Nobody knows. Mm. It is defined by the man who is making the uh, allegation. And mm -hmm. before you could say Jack Robbins, the deputy governor is thrown out there in the cold, mm -hmm. and that's it. So I am a little bit worried. No matter what the issues are, some people have said that uh, Shaibu had it coming. Mm -hmm. Maybe. But did he commit any crime by aspiring to be governor? Mm -hmm. My take is no. Despite all the things that have been said about zoning and, and all that, if our democracy, and democracy should be what it is, government of the people by the people well, for the people. Can I ask one thing, though? I don't, I don't think we specified exactly what the role of the deputy governor is. Because in an instance where you can simply just kick a deputy governor out and then employ another one with only five months to go, what exactly is that 
person, that individual, that new governor going to do in the, in the next five months? And why is it so easy to just kick out um, the deputy governor? That's the I, point I am making, mm. that the Constitution, those who are talking about tinkering with the Constitution amendment, mm -hmm. they must look at the role of a deputy governor. Mm -hmm. If we don't need a deputy governor, then we have governors who are already emperors. Mm. Let them oversee the affairs of the state. Mm. But to have the position of the deputy governor, we must ensure that they are assigned constitutional rules and that it is not very, very easy for somebody to wake up in the morning and just kick out a deputy governor and appoint another one on his own. Mm. I don't think that is proper. That is my position on all this. Let us take away the politics of whatever it is it is absurd, if you ask me, that we have elevated our governors to emperors in their states, okay. and they can do all they want to do without anybody questioning them. Speaking of elevation, let's uh, let's talk about uh, we we also got the legality of, of this as well. When Ms. Ms. Uh, Sam Cabo, you are San and also an indigene of the state as well. Let me turn to you and let's understand the legality of this. Um, like he said, the governor is now, we've now gone to a point of our democracy where governors are now made emperors of state. And I think we also had this conversation uh, off, you know, off record. But what's your own take on this? And, and do you toe the same line as, uh, as uh, Ike Chukwu? Um, <clears throat> let me start with the way the presidency, oh, sorry, the state executive is conceptualized. We have a single uh, governor. At the central, you have a single executive. The same thing you have in the state. It's a single executive that you have in the state. Yes, the constitution says before you go into the election as a governor, you are supposed to have a deputy, and the deputy will become one when you win. And uh, the constitution also made some, what would I call it now? fundamental uh, rules and give those rules to the deputy governor. But aside from you being a governor in waiting, that is, should uh, what the constitution say, if it happens, you become one, you are not in any way better than the errand boy of the governor. The governor is the executive and most of the time, we saw that in the case of Obasanjo and uh, Article. Article won in court, but yet Obasanjo went ahead and withdrew all uh, the mm -hmm. powers and all the facilities and all the enablements for him to act as vice president. And uh, Article was left floating for the whole of the tenure. And that is the way the governor can also uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. act in the state if he chooses to act. But Mr. let me Sam. come back to this. Okay, go ahead. So let yeah. me come back to this. You understand? You see, um, Obaseki, Godwin Obaseki represents what is actually bad, all that is bad in our own democracy. He spent four years without a state house of assembly. And uh, <clears throat> the man with the boots on the ground was Swaibu. Both of them connived. You, um, appropriated the state, pushed aside the state house of assembly. Of course, the judiciary is not in any way better than the state house of assembly in the face of the imperial state governors. So what did you have? They ruled without any checks and balances for four years. And this time around, of course, the same judiciary that they made not to work within the state is fall back to it, and uh, he has seen the effect of what you have when you don't have an effective judiciary that can check the uh, 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 imperial uh, governor. The imperial, like uh, Amity said, somebody wakes up one day and says, I don't want the, my deputy governor. He goes to the state of assembly. The state of assembly would overnight dig up some funny stories and said, in our view, this amounts to what? Across misconduct. Because that's what the constitution says. It's the sad. constitution says you either breach the provisions of the constitution or you act in a way that the state of assembly uh, consider to be 
across misconduct. Mr. Sam, and I have a question. Um, now, regarding the presence and the swearing in, uh, swearing in almost immediately of Godwins, that's marvelous Godwins, uh, the fact that he was actually present there, does that kind of like take away from the credibility of whatever investigations went into Schweibel's investigations by the party or by the governor or, 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 or the body? Does it make it seem preemptive is what I'm asking? It does. It does. But, you know, um, the entire impeachment uh, process is not a penal process. It's a political process. Mm. It's basically a remedial process. And uh, once the impeachment is made, no court can reverse it. You know, of course, somebody said in the case of Vlad Duja and all of that, yes, at, at that time, because they didn't go through the, the process, you had uh, the State House of Assembly now being well constituted to act the way it did. Yes, in that case, you can. But in this case, the moment they've made that, they've gone through the processes. Somebody set up a Kankaru uh, a panel, and the panel overnight, without waiting for the 30 days that I said, and even with a court order, they went ahead and make their own report to say, yes, we found him guilty of uh, the uh, charges. And uh, of course, you should expect what will happen. And that's what happened. The State House of Assembly acted on that, and the gentleman is in peace. Mm. We, we do understand that. Uh, let's look at Edo State and even the in party politics that's going on there, right? Um, there's a lot of uh, there's campaigning going on at the moment uh, for uh, vying for the the, the, the the seat of power, and that's at the governorship. Now, Marvelous Godwins was only last year competing for office in Edo State under a different party, and that's the Labour Party, to be exact. How authentic does it make the impeachment move by the Edo State Assembly? I know um, uh, Sam just talked a bit about whether or not it's legal or not, but let's look at it from a different standpoint. He was competing for another position under another party, and now, out of nowhere, he's been handpicked to become deputy governor. I'll start with you. You know, let's, let's don't mix the two. You know, the impeachment is one side, and the choice of uh, the deputy is something, of course, is an offsuit, a consequence of the impeachment. Uh, but once the impeachment is made, of course, the, the, the uh, vacuum has to be filled. But somebody has raised the point whether or not the State of House of Assembly actually gave their own consent. I did not see any time, at any time, that the name of the gentleman was presented to the House, the House had on it, and uh, uh, made the approval. Mm. Mm. Well, thank you very much, sir. Let me, say, Kichuku, let me come to you now. Let me ask this now. Um, that he was, I know Mr. Sam just said that it's, it's two different things, but the fact is that it seems very arbitrary that you can just make any selection, anyhow, just pick from any party and make a, a, a replacement into your party. That also might also seem to uh, affect the credibility or authenticity of these uh, uh, choices. So, Mr. Ikechuku, I, I don't know, what do you think about that? LP to PDP or AP and also all, all the uh, parties, what's your take? It still goes back to what I said earlier. It's all about the impunity in the system and the fact that the governors really are not accountable to anybody, not even the constitution that they swore. You see, the, 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 uh, the truth of the matter is that I don't even want to bother myself about whether uh, Godwin's was a member of the Labour Party mm -hmm. and if, by virtue of his appointment now, whether he's now a member of the PDP. But there is inherent illegality mm. in the fact of his being sworn in. Because I'm not a lawyer, and Sam will talk better on this. But the Constitution says that the governor ought to submit the name of whoever he has picked. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, the Constitution gave him the, this thing to pick. But he also has submitted the name to the State House of Assembly for approval. That was not done. In fact, the, 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 why the impeachment was going on in the State House of Assembly, Godwin was already uh, on ground at the government house mm -hmm. with his, people uh, from his constituency, including traditional exactly. rulers. And the chief judge was 
threatened him in. So all that we are waiting for was for the pronouncement mm -hmm. to be made, made on the floor of the House of Assembly that Shribe had been impeached and he was in a sworn Mr. Kishuku, let's talk about uh, Philip Shribe now. Now right. he's written to the Chief Justice of Nigeria, Justice Ulukala de Ariola. Uh, he wants to obtain a, a complaint form to file a formal petition against the Chief Judge of Edo State, Justice Daniel Okumbawa. What are the implications of this action, considering the limited time that's left for the governor currently? I think it's only about five months before the next Before the election. next governorship election. I wish him luck, but I don't think anything is going to come out of it. We have, like Sam also said, the judiciary cannot come out of all this mess smelling nice. Nice. <laughs> See, part of the problem we've had since 1999 the judiciary, and that is even more so since 2015 when the APC came into power. They have so much corrupted, I'm sorry to say, they have so much corrupted the judiciary mm. that what we used to know as the, 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 where the common man mm. will go and get some kind of justice mm -hmm. has been eroded. You cannot right now differentiate between the judiciary mm. and the executive. And that is not what mm. it ought to be or how they ought to function. So, well, uh, uh, Bu can try his luck. Like you said, the election is in September. I don't see what they are going to do between now and September that we change the status quo, mm. which is the fact that he is gone. And that is, and look, even the idea of impeachment itself, I think it is just to show him mm -hmm. we can deal with you. Okay, okay. Um, now, real quick, uh, let's, uh, very quickly yeah. to get uh, Sam's uh, uh, viewpoint on this. Sam, from a legal point of view, under one minute, because we're running out of time, quickly, uh, do you think that there, what are going to be the implications? Uh, it's five months uh, to another election, a short period of time. Does he stand a chance? For Shribo. No, I don't. You know, when you, if you are going to the NGC to make a complaint against the chief judge, you are asking for the chief judge to investigate, for the NGC to in investigate the involvement of the chief judge in the constitution of the panel, whether or not he breached the rules or the provisions of the constitution in the uh, empanelment of the panel that uh, investigated him. You know, I think their own concerns that they have raised that i have read is that he, he had picked people whom the constitution say he shouldn't have picked and uh, if the cj is found guilty of that uh, the best that can happen to him is to satisfy his own retributive ego which is that the cj will be punished but it has nothing to do whether or not the impeachment will be reversed you no know, if he wants the impeachment to be reversed that it is not the institution that will handle it. It has to be the court as well. And uh, like I have said, I do not see how that one is what uh, one that the court can review. Mm. On the, the issue of uh, the mm. uh, deputy, the mm. issue is whether or not he's qualified to act mm. as one if he's a member of uh, uh, the LP as at the time he was appointed. Because the commission says before you can be a deputy governor, you must be a member of a political party and it is that political party that would what appoint you to the uh, office for which you are vying for mm. uh, but in this case somebody who is lp uh, has been had picked by an imperial governor who doesn't care about the provisions of the constitution and uh, who had acted for all of his tenure uh, in spite and uh, in utter disregard of the Constitution. So, uh, to me, I think actions of Obasaki should also give concern to those who are now sitting and reconsidering what to do with the Constitution. We cannot afford to have this sort of imperial executives. The word imperial keeps coming up, uh, and you also uh, agree, Mr. Ikechuku, that that seems to be the theme of our conversation this morning regarding the governor of Baseki, imperial, but does that make him impugn to anything? And is anybody going to take a look at that, uh, that theme that seems to be running through all governors across Nigeria as imperialists? 
That's, it is a matter of trying to, you see, in some, I have written about this concerning the presidency. In some other states, okay. places like uh, South Korea, okay. they did okay. not give you all of the executive powers in the hands of one person. Mr. Mr. Sam, Mr. Sam yes, unfortunately, yes, we have run out of time, but on, we, we want to say thank you very much for joining us this morning on our Made in Edition for Breakfast Extra. Thank you also, Mr. Ikechuku Amechi, publisher of the Niche newspaper. We also had Mr. Sam Kagwe here. Uh, thank you, guys. We appreciate that you guys made it this morning on uh, Breakfast Extra. Many thanks to you gentlemen for doing plenty of justice on uh, the story today. And that's all we can take for the very first uh, big story uh, for today. But stick around, there's more mm -hmm. uh, inside the nine o'clock hour. But first, we are going to bring you the news at the top of the hour. This is Breakfast Extra. We didn't introduce ourselves, by no. the way. My <laughs> name is Judith at TV. And of course, my name is Mazino Appeal. So it's about nine o'clock now, and that's going to be time for the news. But before that, just wanted to update real quick that the Channel's TV reporter, we're getting update that has been released. Um, I'm not sure whether rescued or released, but we'll bring you more details as that uh, unfolds. For the news now, we have Dashin Usman, who will be telling us what's going on. Dashin, good morning. Well, thank you so much, uh, Zeno. <laughs> it's nice to be <laughs> Dashin, here. Dashin, good morning to you. You look bright as always. Dashen. Let's just let you go ahead with the news, Dashen. Dashen, please bring us the news. All right. Thank you so much, Zeno and, uh, <laughs> and Judith. All right. Now to the breakfast headlines. The Nigeria Center for Disease Control and Prevention has reported one death and confirmed 15 new cases of Lassa fever within one week across the country. The NCDC said this in a situation report for week 13 published on its website on Friday. Lassa fever is an acute viral hemorrhagic illness transmitted to humans through contact with food or household items contaminated by infected rodents and contaminated persons. Now, its symptoms include fever, headache, sore throat, general body weakness, and in severe cases, unexplainable bleeding from ears, eyes, nose, mouth, and other body openings. Now let's head to north uh, west Nigeria, where scores of people are feared killed in Kukawa village of Maratun local government area of Zamfara State during airstrikes by the troops of the Nigerian army under Operation Hatarindaji. Now, this was as the army denied the killing of any civilian in the state, saying the military was fighting bandits and not the innocent people of the state. An indigent of the village, Musa Abubakar, who narrowly escaped, said his community was performing the Idil Fitr prayer on Wednesday when the Nigerian Air Force bombarded the area. Abubakar said the bombardment led to the death of no fewer than 40 people. No fewer than 27 fishermen have been reportedly killed and three others abducted by the Jamaat uh, Asuna Lidawa Wal Jihad a Boko Haram terrorist group on the border between Cameroon and Nigeria. The terrorists, suspected to be from the Buduma faction of Abu Umeya, Umeima, attacked a local fishing community harboring mostly fishermen from Nigeria at Island Kofia near Darak in the Republic of Cameroon. Now they tied their hands behind their backs before slaughtering them. The sources said the terrorists also abducted three other fishermen after accusing them of spying for the ISWAP faction. The bodies of the fishermen were later dis uh, recovered during a search and rescue operation by troops and their colleagues. Now, away from that, Nigerian government has been urged to enhance security strategies towards the relocation of the resettlement of internally displaced persons in the northeast region of the country. This was during the stakeholders engagement organized by the Mine Action Area of Responsibility consisting of international and national NGOs with the support of United Mine Action Services. News Central's Umaru Kirawa completes the report. Communities are being resettled after many years of displacement in Nigeria's northeast. Stakeholders here deliberate and highlight the importance of conducting thorough surveys and clearances of entire communities and farms before relocating and resettling IDPs. This measure is said to ensure the safety and well-being of returning communities. 
The fact that those IDPs are relocating, we've committed ourselves to creating awareness to them right from the camp before they are relocated to their community. So we are giving them that knowledge, that awareness, that sensitization right from here before they return to their communities for them to stay safe as they return to their communities. Of course, they'll look out, look out for, they, they, they watch out for ground signs, watch out for signs of IEDs, watch out for a lot of signs of those uh, explosive ordinances. The need for deliberate efforts to educate the returning individuals on recognizing ground signs that could indicate the presence of explosive remnants were also discussed. The Nigerian Army, in particular, remains steadfast in our resolve to combat the scourge of mines, unexploded ordnance, and improvised explosive devices in the Middle East theater. Educating the citizens is said to prevent accidents and save lives as the government focuses on post-insurgency recovery. We are trying to enlighten them to let them know that they have to be very careful and know why and how they should exist while going back home. So uh, our issues are now collaborating with all stakeholders to ensure that these people are fully sensitized so that they will open doing and actually get rid of all difficulties and casualties that might arise due to the, 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 the mines that might have been put in place in their areas. It is important that everyone understands the significance of staying safe during the resettlement process in order to sustain the joy that come with the return of peace to the state. In Maiduguri for News Central, Umaru Kirawa. So much, Umaru. Naira on Friday experienced huge appreciation at the official market trading at 1,142.38 Naira to the dollar. Now, data from the official trading platform of the FMDQ Exchange, a platform that oversees the Nigerian Autonomous Foreign Exchange market, revealed that the Naira gained 888.23 Naira. Now, this represents a 7.16% gain when compared to the previous trading date on Monday, 8th April, exchanging at 1,230 Naira 61 Kobo to a dollar before the Idol Fitur holiday. The total daily turnover increased to $281.34 million on Friday, up from $125.55 million recorded on Monday. Now, members of the Nollywood industry have held a candle night procession for victims of the boat mishap that led to the death of Junior Pope and other four crew members at the River Niger in Asaba, Delta State Capital, South South Nigeria. The Candle Night featured prayers for the souls of their colleagues and tributes. News Central correspondent Austin Azu tells us more. The Anambra State Police Command in a press statement by the police public relations officer revealed that two of the bodies were recovered on Thursday night while the last was washed in by the tide this morning. Most members of the Nollywood industry who kept watch throughout the night at the Marine Cable Point Watch side said three out of the five involved in the boat mishap have been buried by the river shore along the River Niger. They told newsmen that some traditional rites were performed for the corpse of Junior Pope and other crew members to be taken to their various states for proper burial. Last night, we were here to like um, 8.39, where they crossed to go and bury the other two corpses that was found. That was found. Rather, we came back. This early morning, we've gone to the mortuary because one of the families said um, they have to bring their child to Abia State. We, we, one of your colleagues was raising money for that, to take him to Abia State. We came and buried the last corpse across the water just now. Some Hollywood actors and actresses who expressed deep pains about the recent unfortunate incident that has been happening in the industry advocated the seeking of spiritual solutions to the situation. The sacrifice of Gina Pope's life will not go without all of us understanding what is right and wrong, what we should and should not do. And the most important thing I want everyone to know is that life is nothing. If anybody offend you, forgive. Let's keep moving and help each other. I'm begging everyone. Nollywood, we have had enough. We pray, we don't see any more. Juno Pop Odomodo is my brother, not only a friend, we are from the same place, Enugu State, Nsuka Nation. 
has been my good friend and my brother. I, in fact, up to now, I've never typed rest in peace because it's very difficult for me to say that or to do that. So I'm not really happy. As you can see, we need prayers. Nollywood need prayers. People should pray for us so that it will stop. These things will stop. God should help us. It has never been there like that in the past, what is happening now. Now that the corpse has been recovered and three of them has been committed to Mother Earth according to the traditions of the land by the river bank, the guild has announced that there will be a candle procession tonight in honor of their colleagues. In Asaba, for New Central, I'm Austin Azu. Thank you, Austin, for that report. And that's it on Breakfast Headlines. Now it's back to the anchors, Mazino and Judith. Thank you very much, Dashin. It was very good to have you here. All right, now, so welcome back. And we have other big stories that we want to talk about. And today, first of all, let's remind you what happened during the week. Judith, please. Oh, yes, indeed. It, uh, of course, the very first and a very sad incident was the fire that happened in Dosumo Market. It happened earlier this week where residents of Lagos woke up to the alarming sound of fire alarms and the sight of fires raging in the Dosumo Market neighborhood of Lagos Island. The situation took a turn for the worse when four of the 14 affected buildings uh, collapsed during the uh, efforts of uh, the, uh, to extinguish the fires. Now, our correspondent at Dushaga was actually on ground. With stellar reporting, by the way, we must say, uh, facing the danger there. She joined us, uh, or she will be joining us later on. But for now, we have Mr. Ibrahim Fahinui with us. He is the coordinator of Lagos Territorial Office of NEMA. You are welcome, sir. Good to have you here on the show today. Good morning Grand. to you, sir. Thank you so much for coming on. I mean, uh, first of all, well done with uh, so far. This is um, the, a fire that happened uh, that it took a turn for the worse we have seen so far from the numbers that we've heard in the press and in the news, 14 buildings have now uh, been raised down. But can you tell us about what the response time li was like and the beginning of the fire, how it started? Just give us an update, an overview of how if your, any challenges um, your or anything. agency was able to chat to rise up to the challenge. Well, uh, based on uh, eyewitness reports, you know, in the last three weeks, we had similar incidents mm -hmm. involving about four multi-story buildings. And uh, that time, we had a partial collapse of building there. Uh, two weeks ago, we met all the sectional heads of the markets. We went to them. We related the challenges. We found out during that Okay. Initial one. Okay. Well, we're going to go on a very short break, but when we come back on the other side, we will continue with our uh, the uh, uh, co coordinator of Lagos Territorial on NEMA, and he's going to give us more insight on the fire incident. Stay with us, and we're anyway. Welcome back. Apologies for that technical, uh, technicality we had there, but uh, we're back now. And we still have with us Mr. Ibrahim Farinlouye from NEMA. Uh, you're welcome again, sir. We asked you earlier before we went, we were asking regarding the challenges that you uh, faced while you were trying to put out these fires and also the response time from NEMA. Well, uh, the response time for responders was less than, less than about five minutes. Mm. Because within that vicinity, we have Nigerian Port Authority Fire oh, good. Service. We have Federal Fire Service, the Zona Headquarters there. Mm. The State Fire Service have about five, I mean, three uh, response Units. St stations yeah, okay. within that area. What kept them a bit late was the surging crowd. Mm. The surging crowd was a major and problem. that's what I wanted to ask about. How did they handle the situation with the crowd, knowing how we react to fires in Nigeria? Throw up your water. What, what was it like exactly uh, dealing with all of that? Well, it's part of uh, what we have been used to. So, you know, at the initial stage, when you are responding, mm -hmm. mobilizing stakeholders will take a little bit of time. But the uh, the community security agencies within that uh, community. You know, we have a C CBA, okay. 
managing the security and they stay within the marketers. So those ones who are trying to work, the Nigerian Neighborhood Watch, they are also there. The Nigerian police, we have about uh, two divisions of the Nigerian police. Immediately the fire started, the radio communication was sent and they started calling here and there. The police were calling, DSS were calling, other agencies were calling for stakeholders to respond. So what we need to do then was to, those who are on ground, what are the level? Mm -hmm. What is the level of disasters from there we are mobilizing from mainland and other stakeholders mm -hmm. within the island there? One good thing was that just barely two weeks after meeting the community, uh, the sectional heads of the association in the whole Lagos Island, we have about 42 different markets within that area. Wow. We met them and we, have, we gave them some hints on what and what to do as preliminary step towards having a very robust uh, mitigation aspect Think to that. Away from mitigation, let's talk a bit about the, um, let's talk a bit about all that was in terms of uh, 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 the, uh, the party in and of itself. Um, <clears throat> so during the, 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 we understand now that 14 buildings had been pulled down in the market. 14 buildings have been pulled down. Why uh, was it necessary to pull down the 14 buildings? Well, it's being pulled down. It's yet to be completed. Okay. These are the most impacted buildings that caught, that had the impact of the fire. Mm -hmm. Possi there is possibility that more of such buildings will go down. But mm -hmm. Lagos State Building Control Agency and the Ministry of uh, Physical Plan will carry out, as directed by the, uh, Mr. Governor, Babajide Shanwolu, that integrity test must be carried out to determine the suitability of okay. continuous use so that it won't pose danger to the lives of any resident mm. or anybody going through that place. Fortunately, you saw what happened while the fire was on. Yeah. Your correspondent... Yeah, she had to take off. She had to take off. <laughs> and you know, it's part of the risk yeah. that journalists yes. always face. Though it's not a risk to journalists, we it's are the used job. to it, but personal safety too. Why you have been trained to know the risk and adapt to the risk, manage the risk, ordinary Nigerians will not know it. Mm. And even if they know it, God forbid syndrome will mm. always keep them at arm's length. Mm. So, so demolition more, do it, carrying out integrity tests is very, very important. Okay. And secondly, the governor have directed that all those closed building that do not have space, the space must mm -hmm. be created. Mm -hmm. So how many buildings will be, determined, will be mm -hmm. uh, pulled down? How many structure shops that will go until when integrity test and the Minister of Fiscal Planning concludes their preliminary investigation? Okay, sir. Test. So um, I have a very interesting question here regarding how you guys managed the situation while the fire was raging. Uh, it's one thing that people argue that the neighbors' reactions are always reactionary, only after, you know. You, but you spoke about the fact that you had a meeting with all the stakeholders, the 42 uh, different associations. However, 42. Yeah, however, there on camera, we saw how people were surging to the fire. They weren't helping, but they were just there watching, videoing, and doing all of that. How did you manage, or how does NEMA manage the instances of crowd now, the crowd, crowd control. control? What exactly do you people do? Let me instances? state this. It's not NEMA, per mm -hmm. se. Mm -hmm. NEMA doesn't, cannot exist without stakeholders. I know the law of the Federation gives the mandate of emergency management to NEMA, but NEMA cannot stay on its own. Based on the regular stakeholders meeting, coordination assessment, coordination meeting, we have identified the challenges we are supposed to have. Like the police, they are aware. We have various organs, task force are there, the DSS will be there. All other local, I mean, state structures will be deployed. As we are having it, we might, because we need to be careful. You can't, because we are responding to disaster, then you hurt anybody along the line. It can, that one can be more fatal to us mm -hmm. 
because the crowd will not see what is happening, that you are rushing. It is the man that is knocked down. Mm. They can react and attack us. So you're saying it's not the duty of Neymar to control the crowd, but no, other saying, stakeholders? You see, when you get to a level, controlling the crowd has to be tactical. Yeah. And it has to be controlled because you don't know whether a journalist is coming in mm. or a security personnel in Mopti is coming in to come and respond. So when you are controlling the crowd, it's also very, very tactical and we have a techn uh, technical way of doing it. The only problem we have is when such incidents or among the crowd who are trying to take a snapshot of the events, they are always diverted. Even when you are trying to control them, move out, move this way, what they are doing, they will get consumed. Mm -hmm. And most uh, another aspect is even when you are responding from your station to get to the scene, the problematic, the major one are the elites on the highway. Oh. They will not give you away. Mm. The commercial drivers, once they hear you from a distance, they give you away. But the elites will even behave as if they are not hearing your siren. All, uh, even the, uh, all efforts to, we, many of us will have to come down start eating their vehicle before they will recall. Uh, and this was the case wow. in this case as well? The elites, yeah. So mostly we have problems with the elites. Okay. What are some problems that you have as well when it comes to fire in terms of um, proactiveness and measures that are being taken to uh, make sure that we don't have consistent fire outbreak? Now, I know that uh, towards the end of uh, 2022, as well as always the first quarter of 2022, the end of during the Hamilton and the dry season, there is always a circular that is put out by the uh, meteorological uh, agency as well as NEMA and every other agency to warn Nigerians against uh, 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 environmental factors and conditions that could contribute to fire. And we know that Lagos is densely populated, but somehow we don't heed to advice and we don't heed uh, to this core by the government and these agencies. And this was the same issue you just pointed out. You're driving on the highway, trying to get to a fire outbreak as quickly as possible, and time matters, but the elite who should know better and not driving out of the way. So what are some issues that you have faced with the average Nigerian when it comes to taking proactive measures to, to, uh, to curb fire incidents or not to even have fire incidents? Well, you know, disaster risk reduction. We are not supposed to be waiting for disaster mm, true. to start. And that was why I said we met the leadership mm -hmm. of the market in that very island to tell them these are some of the things we have found out and what are the solutions. Earlier before that, this year, about two or three years ago, we had met them too. We brought in various insurance companies, introduced it to them. We gave them the idea, fire marshals, at least in strategic position within streets, so that if there is any outbreak, before it gets out of hand, manage it before start to trade agents. Okay, so, so say that again, there's fire marshals in each street. On How exactly areas. are they represented? Uh, fire marshals as in individuals or units or places or the infrastructure? The association leadership will select certain number of persons within their community, okay. within their ah. area. Okay. We train them. Okay as professional firefighters. So how to are manage. they to So assist? once there is anything, information gets to the community. You know, disaster occurs in the community. And the community members are the first responders. Yeah. Once they are able to manage that, what disaster means is any situation that overwhelms the capacity of the community. Mm -hmm. So once the capacity of that community goes off, Mm -hmm. When they are overwhelmed, it is then they need uh -huh. the assistance, either of NEMA or any other agency. So we are trying, what we told them then was, mm -hmm. let us train you. Yeah. Then disaster management is bottom up. It uh, has to start from the grassroots. Yes, indeed. Up. So the children, we have disaster risk reduction club in almost all the secondary schools. Oh, we right. have grassroots uh, drivers, executive uh, uh -huh. volunteers on disaster management are there. So what we have been doing, is to let them know the essence. And one important thing, apart from the elites on the road, when disaster occurs, the adults always forget. They get traumatized and they get frustrated on what to do mm. at that particular time. But the children, while we train them, the children will always remember what they have learned in classrooms. So they will 
rise up, call, they mostly they call the attention of their parents. Okay. Oh, this is what we are taught. Can you do this? Ah. And most of them have the emergency mm. numbers mm. of various organizations, the Nigerian police, the DSS. We roll it out to them while we are training them. Okay. Not That's very interesting, on sir. And other areas. Very interesting. So I can imagine that you guys would actually have functions in schools where you go and teach children so that they're able to disseminate these messages to their parents. Ms. Ibrahim, thank you very much for coming Many through. You've also you. educated us because we found out some things about NEMA that we didn't know, especially about the marshals. That's very interesting. And I hope that you guys continue on. Yes, with that I work. think you two, you need a proper training in this. Oh, school. yes, we yeah, do. No, we do. <laughs> because I've looked you. around, I've assessed the whole compound. I, are, I trust you're welcome. Trouble. You're welcome. I trust to please you. come in and train I, us. Oh, and we, we expect <laughs> you to come in as well. It's uh, very, very important. Thank uh, you very much. We sir. have uh, lots of cables and wires and everything else lying mm -hmm. around. And of course, uh, thank you again, once again, sir, for coming on. Uh, we're going to continue now where uh, this has been more conversation with uh, the coordinator, Lagos Territorial, uh, NEMA, and he's been talking to us about the fire incident at Dosumu Market. Now we're going to take a look at the big report that was by Adeshawa Udushoga, our correspondent here, who was live at the fire incident and almost got caught when the building uh, collapsed there from the fire. She's going to join us as well as a real estate expert to help us put into perspective what it would mean to restructure the market. This is Big Story. Stay with us. Actually, I believe that their response was quite impressive because unlike what I noticed... I'm sorry, there's a situation here and um, the building where this fire started has now collapsed completely. Uh, we had to run for safety, but the building where the fire started has now collapsed completely from what you can see now. Um, that is building that you can see that has just gone down now was where the fire started. And we had seen indications that the, the building was going to cave in anytime soon. And then there's a whole of a pandemic, pandemonium going on here. If you can still hear me, um, I don't know what next is going to happen here because it looks as though and we can hear her live right here in the studio. <laughs> Correspondent Adesha Wadushoga, she displayed stellar reporting in the face of danger. She joins us live in the studio to shed light on the details that didn't make it in our initial report. And she's here with us. Also joining us is Kolade Adekboju. He is the managing director and CEO of Real Homes. And they're going to join us now to just talk to us about the fire incident, mm -hmm. uh, what happened behind the scenes when Adesha was reporting. Besides... Mm -hmm. That building caving in, as well as what it would mean to restructure. Adishawa. Let, let me say this, Adishawa. Congratulations, first of all, for surviving that. Thank it was you. fantastic having you. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Um, do that report and having you back here. Thank, <laughs> Thank goodness. Um, uh, however, I just wanted to point out something. Okay. What's it been like since after the response from people, social media, when you walk down the street? Do people recognize you? Were, were you getting calls from family like, yo? <laughs> like SS2 classmates. Like SS2 classmates. <laughs> SS2 classmates. <laughs> and stuff like from that. From Facebook groups that you Definitely. forgot you were part of. Yes. Uh, wow. So um, it's been so overwhelming since then. And I used to say, like, I, did, I never knew that this week would turn out to be so dramatic. Wow, like dramatic. Like it did because... Immediately when, um, when the video was posted on New Central's Instagram platform, I got a call from my sister first. I know you would have seen a comment on the page and said, when are you resigning? <laughs> and then the next, the, no, next no. Comment, the next comment was, I'm going to go and tell mommy straight off. And then my brother-in-law also said, okay, let me go and show mommy this video now. I think it's time. And before they could even show my mom, apparently when I was live, um, my mom's friend had passed because mm. um, a relative uh, one of, uh, got, uh, shop got affected. Then she was oh, screaming she was there. my name. Yes, there, she was there. there on the spot. She was screaming, oh. and I was signaling to her, that, okay, I'm live. I cannot say oh, wow. hi. But by the time she got home, she already told my mom that I saw your daughter in the fire incident. I said, God. <laughs> then my mom was calling me, Where are you? I said, Okay, I'm out. I said, No, what part of work are Which you? Part of I said, Island. Okay, let me just tell you. I'm covering another Dusmo fire because I'd covered one two weeks prior. Yes, you are our moment. fire reporter. <laughs> So she was like, why are you always the one that they will send to go and cover fire? Can't that can another person just go for it? Um, but it's been uh, really overwhelming because I had no clue that that particular video would go viral. Mm. And um, for what it happened was that um, we knew the previous one that I had covered, the previous Dusumo fire, we yeah. actually, if a, a building actually collapsed just before us as well, just that wow. we couldn't capture that live. And then when this one happened, it was like I had experience already that mm. when fire incident like this happened, when you see like some cracks, when you, see, when you hear some sound you in the building, there's a down. possibility that the building will go in, go down, I mean. So when I saw that, I just told the camera person, we need to stay 
some steps away from this building. I feel like the building will collapse while we are doing the live report. And then luckily for New Central, we were able to capture that as it was happening live because most the other TV stations did not know that something like that was going to happen. So everybody was just busy taking like close up shot of um, the victims. Okay. And then when it happened, we were, we, I mean, we're lucky to be the only one that took it. And the first thing on my head was just run. I did not look back. So <laughs> when I saw the comments of, she did not even look back. I knew that that was going to happen. So somewhere in my mind was when you hear a sound, just run, just run. because something is going to likely happen here. And then kudos to my cameraman, of course. Oh, he, he was, was, oh, was fantastic. It was quite right. like he was facing the distance, but both of us know that anything like this would likely happen. So he gave me the confidence to keep reporting mm. because the first thing I did when I ran off, I, I saw that he was still standing and where he was was safe, safer than where I was standing. And then I just said, let me go and stand behind him okay. and keep reporting. Right. So later I was signaling to him that if you can capture me here and not, because that place it was already dusty yeah, and there exactly. was no way we could do anything. So he said, no, that let's just keep focusing on the people and the building, that I should just keep talking, that they don't need to see my face. They can hear your voice. Yeah, so right. just that was fantastic. And, that was, and that's really amazing. Well done. Because, I mean, uh, when I saw the video, uh, when it was posted, of course, on the, mm. on the platform, and I saw it, and the well, first thing I noticed was the people who were standing right above the debris as it fell, I was worried that there were going to be people trapped, trapped under yeah. there as well. Was that also your fear yes, as well? Yes, so right the, immediately I saw the building go down. The point where the building fell, I, I saw some people, even NEMA, some members of NEMA were actually like there on that spot. And then the firefighters as well, they were right on that spot where the building fell. Mm. So I was, the, the next thing in my mind was, where are those guys? I hope, I hope nobody safe. was hurt. Yeah. So by the time I looked back, I saw that they were all like, I could count like, familiar faces were all still right. there. And okay, I think they're safe. Koladi, uh, it's <laughs> well done. Koladi, we know that so far so good, 14 buildings have now been yes. pulled down. The uh, markets have been closed down um, till further notice. They've also asked more traders, you were there, uh, Ladishewa, to go pack their things. It looks like more building maybe be pulled down uh, in the coming days and weeks. And so he begs to ask the question, right, okay. in terms of, first of all, and most importantly, the environment that our market is and the planning of this market. Mm -hmm. The vicinity and the buildings are so clustered together, that's one. Two, all of these businesses are busy. They, they power themselves. Either it's a diesel power generator mm -hmm. or a petrol power generator, but they power themselves. And because they're so cl densely close, close together. together, they have the generators you know, situated inside of the yeah. building. And many of those buildings double, same as the storefront, same as the warehouse. It begs to ask the question of how did we get here? Okay. So um, when I got the, um, the invite that I'll be here, so I, I'm familiar with the Sumo market. Okay. I have a lot of people there. So I make some calls to know what, we, because this has been happening. Maybe in one year, I've heard like three times. So yeah. I, I asked the, the guy what happened this time, and so he told me the guy was fueling, was putting fuel inside the gen first of all. But I don't think people know that in that house there are a lot of wells stuck in that building. Oh, so I'm sure people don't know. So there are a lot of generators. There are a lot. Of course, so be a lot aside of from cans. the generator, there are black markets. Oh, they have jet, they have fuel stuck in that building. Wow. So when he told me that, um, I, was, I was thinking about it because I know if I in Dosumu, you don't even have a street there. You, you want to go to other building, you have to pass through one tiny place. And to jump get into yes, the yes. next so building. How did this happen? First of all, I would say that um, we, we, you know, Nigeria, N N Nigeria doesn't, um, Lagos, let me use Lagos, mm -hmm. the market. That place, I, I checked back to the history of the place too. That place was one of the first places in, in Lagos states that happened, and it, was, it wasn't that, like, that it was residential before people start thinking of, let me turn this to that. The moment the government noticed that, I think that should have been cut here, should mm. have been stopped mm. earlier. Because even in a residential um, building that is not a commercial building, you need 4.5 meters um, setback. Mm. You know, that is residential. You're not talking about commercial. You should have more because, of course, it means that the density of the people that will be coming there will be more. Mm. The law of transaction will be happening there. So yeah. I, 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 I want to, first of all, commend the governor for shutting that place down. Yeah. You know, yeah. we, 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 can't be, we can't be sentimental, emotional here. Yes. No matter, I heard one person is dead, you know, yeah. um, but I, I don't think there's any amount of money that can be compared to one human life. You know, you can you can lose any amount, but you can get it back. But you can when you lose your life, you can't get it back. Okay. So shutting that place down is a very good decision. 
But what me I would advise as a um, real estate practitioner is that, yeah, we shouldn't stop that place from being a commercial hub. But we could, all those big buildings that is coming down, as the information I got from the guy, everywhere is shut down, no market mm. happening there. What about the people who live there? Because some people actually live in these Yeah, whether you are living, whether... Now, we, we, another thing, that's another... That's another um, um, Aspect um, of the situation. Uh, irony, like, it's not, it's not right, it's not proper to live, to live in that uh, kind of place. Now that you've said that, let me ask you, we have other settlements in Lagos that are beginning to become like that, and I'll give you a few examples. Okay. Suruliri, for instance, used yeah. to be absolutely residential, yeah. but now when you go through Suruliri, yeah. your boutique store is there. Where did you get way. this? Where did you get this? No, please don't ask. <laughs> no, I mean, I you just go down names. the street, the, the <laughs> next, you're names. living here, the next street is a boutique. Yeah. And it's, Festac is also becoming so. We right. have blocks of flats that have yeah. all the, all uh, all of its uh, uh, first or ground floor. Right. They're all now stores. The same same goes and for Lekki Admiralty Ways, where you Admiralty see a kiosk building in front of yeah. what should be a mall. So what could be done when you see these instances happening? They're burgeoning. They're growing. What advice do you have for the government? So like I said, earlier. and that will. By the way, this will also affect people's livelihoods. Remember, of course, it will. But um, like I said earlier, life is more important than any amount of money. Now look at um, the building that came down. Of course, now, you are talking about livelihood, 17 buildings down, the livelihood is already affected. Mm. If it was prevented, it, couldn't, it won't be as that was. House was raised down, fire, you know. So I would say that, you know, this thing is a progression. You see the signs before it becomes um, a, a, a serious <laughs> disaster issue. itself. So, like, in the likes of Surulere you talk about, the likes of Festac you talk about, what is the original plan? Every, every city, every state has a, something called master plan. Mm -hmm. If you have a master plan that this should be, <coughs> this should be residential, there shouldn't be any reason why it should turn into a commercial. But then, the same government, that, or, or what we used to be called FHI, yeah. They are the same people who, back in the 90s and early uh, noughties, were responsible for still trading or selling these uh, properties to Exactly, because yeah. so, why so, are you selling so, permits so, and properties exactly. to so, places that should okay, be Okay, so let me give you an instance now. When you look at um, Lagos, it, according to the master plan, a place supposed to be like forestry, agriculture, a reason. Mm -hmm. yes. But, you know, because Lagos, it does not have so much land. It's, it's understandable. They had to turn that place to, okay, they had to give a go-ahead to people to start using that place for residential. That has to be turned, changed. You know, that place still makes sense if you have a place for forestry or yeah. agriculture use and you are turning into residential. But when it comes to, and also you also have to regulate how many people will be in that building. Look at that Dosumu market now. You see, this place is too, is too, if they want to turn this kind of place, they can turn into like, maybe like 50, 50 shops. 50, yeah. <laughs> 50 <bet. outlets. laughs> It what? is wild what happens. In fact, I remember when I went to Lagos Island, it was around the broad, mm. um, Breadfruit, Broad yeah. Street area. I, I went, I was looking for a pair of jeans. Yeah. Same old. <laughs> so I'm going in looking for it. And then, you oh, know, you one bent day, down too. Wait, <laughs> <now. laughs> no, okay. And so I was looking for, I was going through stores. And then the man who was there says, okay, Auntie, I have more for you. Follow me to my other store. Oh. And I follow him. Please tell us why we go under. What should be a parking lot? Yeah. What should be underground parking yeah. is where people are situated, selling fabric. Warehouses, and actually. It's warehouses. And guess what? They have a central AC unit inside that place. It is wild. I have never seen it. And so those, are, those persons, there, the people that could be in 50s, more than maybe, maybe 80 uh, shops, uh, uh, give or take. And you're going in and out of shops, mm -hmm. right? It's wild. Can I, can I read, direct this to uh, um, Adesha right here? So, while this was going on, how was it getting to the uh, to ground zero? Right. What were the streets like? What, we asked our previous guest about crowd control. Yeah. What was it like getting there? And if you were a first responder or an ambulance, or what would it have been like? Do you think? Give us it's a clear picture. It's always difficult to even, as a journalist, to even yeah. locate where the fire is burning. So most times we just keep tracing the, the smokes. Ooh, okay, smoke. okay, this is where it's coming from. And then when you get, so this particular one, I, I and uh, Mr. Thomas, when we were trying, to, we went like, we did a 360 degree turn mm -hmm. because we went to the first point Had where the previous through. fire happened. It could actually lead us to where the fire happened, but there were so many crowds and people were really shouting at us, go, go and pass another place. So when they saw that I, I was holding the microphone, mm -hmm. she's a journalist, I watch, watch, she's a journalist, so go and pass another place. So we turned. We went to another point, that's the second point. We couldn't find a way in because people were, like, the crowds were so much. 
and then we had people parked their cars and yeah. some people were still selling like it was a normal day wow yes other shops that were close to the fire spots were the still fire selling were still selling and they were <laughs> like normal commercial activities were going on you would if you if you hadn't seen smokes you would not know well, that the normal fire day. was burning like just at, by, by the neighborhood. And now I understand why the governor would have shot it down yes, because so, so I understand yes. that people would I have think so gone that, back that, there that, too. That, that prompted the governor to do that because mm -hmm. for every time, I mean, I've, I've covered a couple of fire accidents in Lagos, you don't water market. And yeah, like you that. have. How so the entrance, <laughs> the entrance to um, a, a, a particular store that is burning, you would never have imagined that something like that is happening at the other end. So Ooh. it took us like 360 turning before we wow. could even locate that spot. And when we did, we were literally like fight, fighting for our lives, trying to walk Penetrate in between through. crowds yeah. until I spotted a policeman. I said, please, we're journalists. We're just trying to It'll locate the place. So fire. he cleared the way for us. And it was even difficult for him until he brought out his sticks and rifle before they could wow. respect him. Wow. So I wonder sometimes how uh, the first response. So let me point out something. In the comment section, I was going, where well, you can notice I was going to mention when Debola asked that, um, how did the fire responders, how did they, um, mm -hmm. what was their, yeah, um, response so like and I was saying it was impressive that was the that is the first time in many times that I would say that oh nice. they were impressive That's good. because two weeks earlier the people were really agitated at the fact that they came about four hours later mm. and then that was the the turning the, the, the point of anger for many people that if you were here earlier you wouldn't None have gotten this to this happened. point right. so when I got there when I got to this particular one they said oh and they tried to they've been here since and indeed when I got there I saw like about five trucks trying to like simultaneously put out the fire. So when I tried to say that, that was when the collapse happened, and someone in the comment section said, oh, it's because I lied. So I have to say that we need to also give credit to these people. It's always difficult to locate the point of incident right, yeah. many times. Uh, guys, um, I, I, we have to let you go because we're running out of time, but mm -hmm. very quickly, you were there at the incident when they were shut down and they were asked for every of the traders to, va to vacate the, build, the place, mm -hmm. the market, and you saw firsthand the traders and what their sentiments were. I'm going to ask you about that, but also I'll ask you what it would cost for the government to restructure. You've got 40 Real seconds quick, to answer yeah. each. Okay. You're a lot of money. Uh, okay, so for the traders, when, when, I mean, when I looked into their eyes, it was very emotional. I, I, I felt bad because this, some people's life de is dependent on those small stores that mm. you see. And in the, there was an old woman who said that she had been there since 1942, I wow. guess. Like she was born in the market. Now she has to give away, I mean, a give home. out all of those things. I mean, because <sighs> of the fire. So, um, but unfortunately, it has to be done because if we are being honest, they, they are settling on illegal structures and the governor said, you know what, we are no longer going to tolerate this. So, I want to see. Okay. okay, so I, I, I it's going to take a whole lot of money, a whole lot of planning, and uh, I'm also going to. I'm thinking, will government want to do that? You know, because there are a lot of projects out there. So, but mm -hmm. I will encourage them if they want to do anything there, they should turn into a, a standard commercial hub and let's give these people maybe a 20 years um, to pay for the outlet or 30 years. That will also console them and make them know that they didn't lose out rightly. Okay. Mm -hmm. thank you. I want to say thank you very much for coming. Anna Deshwa, you especially, thank you very much. Oh, thank I'm you. not disregarding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll just our <laughs> Euro. Just the market <laughs> might have come down and might have uh, been shut down, but your market went up. I think your price, your bright <laughs> I told price you is not now. To do this, uh, your bright uh, price is now how much? <laughs> Let's put it out there. <laughs> <laughs> just in case. But thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, and many thanks to you, Koladi, thank for you. coming on. We appreciate you for doing this in such short, short notice. And that's all we can take right here for our big report. Our star reporter, of the week, Adeshawa Odushoga, who covered the Dosumu fire, as well as Kolade Adekboju. He is uh, the manager, director, and CEO, Real Homes. Uh, coming up next is sports, and I think that our sports guys are live and on standby, ready to go for us. Uh, sports, hey guys, are you there? I'm sure right, they well, are. I'm <laughs> trying to be back. Let's, uh, let's take sports. Stay with us. <laughs> And now for sports, yes, sports, we have Onyechi Obara in the studio with us. Take it away now. All right, in the world of sport, um, breakfast extra, we've started with the world of athletics where African indoor record holder, Favor Ophili, she blazed to her second fastest season yeah, opener and the fastest time outdoors in two okay. years. This at the Tom Joe's Memorial Classic on Friday, April 13, taking charge of a hit to win the scotch in 2 2 3, three seconds which automatically qualifies her for that Paris 2024 Olympics. The time also doubles as the fastest time overall in the competition. Ophelia continues to display brilliant form this season, having raced to her fastest time under all conditions 
a stunning 10.85 seconds at the Battle of Bayou a fortnight ago. Moving away from that, we talk about one man who has been redeemed from his doping violation ban. We we'll say Chijin Du Uja has been recalled to Britain's 4 by 100 meter squad for the World Athletics Relays in May, 10 months after serving his ban for a doping violation, which resulted in his team being stripped of the silver medal at the Tokyo Olympic Games. Sprinter Uja was banned by the Athletics Integrity Unit, ARU, for 22 months in October 2022 which was backdated from August 2021 to June 2023. However, the AIU had um, cleared Uja of um, intentionally taking prohibited substances. Uja's teammates, Richard Kitty, Zanel Hugis, and Nathaniel Mitchell-Blake, also had their medals stripped. All four sprinters were named in the eight-man 4x100 relay squad for the World Athletics Relays in Bahamas on May 4-5, 2024 giving Uja another shot to redeem himself before the Olympic Games in Paris will begin from July 26 to August 11. Good news for Nigerian football as the Nigerian Football Federation, the NFF, has appointed former Under-17 World Cup winner Manu Garba as the head coach of the Nigerian Under-17 boys, popularly known the Golden Eaglets. Garba had, in the same role, led the Golden Eaglets to a win in the FIFA on the 17 World Cup for Nigeria in the United Arab Emirates in 2013. So Nigeria's fourth triumph at the stage. Garuba's World Conquering Squad in 2013 included Kelechi, Hanacho, Taiwa, Wuni, Isaac Success, Musa Mohammed, and Chide Bere, Mwakali. And also not forgetting goalkeeper Dele Alampasu in the squad. The former Nigerian international will now immediately resume the role and take charge of the team's preparation for next month, the Waffle B on the 17th Championship, taking place in Ghana. Now, on a rather sad note right now, I would say Kaja Chief have been able to do something wonderful for their deceased um, player. South African Premier Soccer League giants, Kaja Chiefs, have taken a heartfelt step of retiring the jersey number 26 in honor of late Luke Fleur who tragically lost his life, of course, in the hijacking accident uh, last week. The announcement was made by Chief Sporting Director Kaja Chief Mutwang Jr. during a memorial service at the FNB Stadium, attended by close family, friends, teammates, club officials and legends, as well as the representatives from other premiership clubs, including Mamalodi Sundowns and Supersport United. Luke Fleur, a promising defender, was eagerly awaiting his official debut for the Amakosi has left a void in the football community. His jersey number becomes the only second in the club's history to be retired, following the iconic number 15 with Dr. Kumalo once wore. Ladies and gentlemen, so rest in peace. Moving away from here to the Futsa African Cup of Nation, where the Pharaohs of Egypt beat Libya 4 0 in the opening fixture of Group B of the ongoing Cat Futsal Afghan in Rabat, Morocco. The winners of the first three editions of the quadrennial competition showed their dominance against the Mediterranean Knights at that state Prince Mole Abdullah Stadium on Friday. Mohamed Abdurazak Korki scored twice and a goal each for Ala Isa and Mohamed Mohamed Karaka. They handed Egypt that perfect start to the tournament. Meanwhile, in the same group, we've got Mauritania, who defeated Namibia five goals to four in a nine-game thriller that saw Mauritania take control in the battle of the debutants. Of course, we've got um, Yakuba Sila scoring twice to help Mauritania to that victory. The three-time champions will look ahead to face Namibia on Sunday, while Libya will look to redeem themselves against Mauritania on the same day. Now the Serie A are about to make a strong decision. AC Milan, to be precise, is the best seat in the house. Other clubs offer similar experiences, including the Tunnel Club at the Manchester City Etihad Stadium, where the players make their way to the pitch through a glass tunnel, a beautiful one. Fans can also enjoy that hospitality at the San Siro. There you have it. Spot update at this time. Back to you, Magzino and Judith Atibi.
Well, I want to say thank you very much, all of you, for joining us. Because it's so oh, yes, you for joining us because I mean, they have a very, they made a very good choice. The spot desk bringing you on our very first show. Oh really? Yes, they did. <laughs> <laughs> Zeno, you Mrs. Need O'Baro. To, you need to be stopped. <laughs> thank you very much. Anyway, let's about you on to news now. As Dashan Usman is on standby to bring you the news. Dashan is up next for news. Thank you so much, uh, Judith. Now it's time for the breakfast headlines, and I'm Dashan Usman. Now, in Nigeria, Center for Disease uh, Control and Prevention has reported one death and confirmed 15 new cases of Lassa fever within one week across the country. The NCDC said this in a situation report for week 13 published on its website on Friday. Lassa fever is an acute viral hemorrhagic illness transmitted to humans through contact with food or household items contaminated by infected rodents or contaminated persons. Its symptoms include fever, headache, sore throat, general body weakness, cough, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, muscle pains, chest pain, and in severe cases, unexplainable bleeding from ears, eyes, nose, mouth, and other body openings. The remains of an adult male suspected to be one of the victims involved in an accident that occurred on the third mainland bridge in Lagos State on Wednesday has been recovered. Two passengers reportedly fell into the lagoon after a commercial bus crashed on the bridge. Now, given an update on Friday, the Lagos State Emergency Management Authority said the body was found floating around the Ebutero end of the lagoon. The Urobo Progress Union Youth Wing Worldwide and the Urobo Youth Leaders Association have both declined participation in the military board of inquiry regarding the incident at Okwama Community, Delta State, southern Nigeria, where 17 soldiers were ambushed and killed. The two groups opted, through, opted out through a statement signed by Samuel Ogotomo, president of the Urobo Youth Leaders Association, and Ugere Blessed, president of the UPU Youth Wing Worldwide. The resolution was presented at the meeting of the Army Panel of Inquiry in collaboration with the Delta State Government, led by Edwan Uzo, the Special Advisor to the Governor on Peace Building and Conflict Resolution at Governor's Annex, Ejeba Wari Delta State. They cited the involvement of the Nigerian Army in the matter as a reason for their decision, believing that the Army, being a party to the issue, will not be able to conduct an unbiased investigation or adjudication. Naira on Friday experienced huge appreciation at the official market targeting at or tag trading at 1,142 1, Naira 38 Kobo to the dollar. Now data from the official trading platform of the FMDQ exchange, a platform that oversees the Nigerian autonomous foreign exchange market, revealed that the Naira gained 88 Naira 23 Kobo. This represents a 7.16% gain when compared to the previous trading date on Monday, April 8th, exchanging at 1,230 Naira 61 Kobo to a dollar before the Idelfitter holiday. The total daily turnover increased to $281.34 million on Friday, up from $125.55 million recorded on Monday. Two suspected members of an Ethiopian regional militia plotting an attack died on Friday along with a civilian during a shootout with police. The Fano self-defense militia took up arms against government forces they had formerly supported in the Amhara region a year ago. A February parliament extended a state of emergency imposed last August in Amhara, the country's second most populous region with 23 million people, in an attempt to quell a Fano insurgency. The Fanos and other Amharas felt betrayed by a peace agreement signed in November 2022 by the government and Tigrayan rebels, longtime foes of Amhara nationalists who claim parts of Ethiopia's northernmost region as their ancestral lands. A Tunisian, a young Tunisian man has died after self-immolating in an act of protest against the police in the central region of Kairouan. Yassin Selmi, a 22-year-old construction worker, died in a hospital in Tunis two days after setting himself on fire 
in front of a police station. He was attempting to resolve a fight between two people and police officers near a police station when the officers threatened to arrest him in Bo Hajla, a small town in Kairan. The young man later came back to the police station with a gasoline container and set himself on fire in protest over the police threats. His father is seeking justice for his son's death. And that's it on Breakfast Headlines. I'm Darshan Usman. Now it's back to the anchors. Thank you very much, Darshan Usman. But let's take a quick break. When we get back, we've got something very interesting for you from the African scape. Well, thank you very much. It's the third hour here for Breakfast Extra, and it's time to lighten up the mood. Let's take a peek at the editorial cartoons that had us chuckling or maybe, uh, you know, uh, disappointed. Now, these witty illustrations have a knack for adding a little dash of humor to the often very gloomy news cycle that we get every single week. So you want to grab your coffee and let's just enjoy some of these. I also have Judith on standby. Judith, you're going to be joining me on this one as well, aren't you? Yes, Even indeed. though it's your favorite uh, segment. It is but, my uh, favorite. I know it's yours. Like I said from before, I have always loved the strips, the cartoons that hit the dailies every single time. From when I was a kid, in fact, I'm wondering why I didn't even become a cartoonist myself. Maybe I still have a chance because I think I can still draw. But let's take a look at our very first one right now this morning. Coming from, I think it's going to be the Punch newspaper. Let's check it out. Now this one, uh, Punch newspaper from the 10th. Uh, this month if you take a look at this one now I i'm actually taking a look at it from a monitor in front of me but you can check this one out behind me now it says um it's talking about the naira instance when it comes to the borders um between nigeria and especially niger um uh, the uh, naira speaking to the france hey we don't need your greeting here please go away no bonjour in this place um i don't know judith if you learned about the story from earlier inside this week where people have been rejecting the naira in uh, border towns in the north and a very sad incident, if you ask me, because it's like there was one time where the Naira was indeed the giant. It, the end was proud, True. but now it's, uh, it's, it's way too long. It's uh, way gone now at this point. Yeah, indeed. Let's take a look at our next one this morning. What do we have? Um, we have, this is from the Punch newspaper again from the 4th. Ido Fitri, please, mommy, go and get your own Ido Fitri from uh, Alaji. It's talking about the instance when it comes to the, um, uh, well, there's no food in town, but people are still spending big when it comes to these celebrations. The Fitri celebrations happen on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. You can imagine the impact that had on the economy because all, all works or whatever you call it were all shut down. Uh, it was an interesting instance. I'm going to move real quickly from this one and move on to our very next one now for this morning from Inside of the Week, and that's coming from the Guardian newspaper. It's a very long one. Today's eclipse. Um, must have been very visible uh, from all over the world. But here in Nigeria, the concern is not the fact that we did not see the sun, it's that we're not seeing what it is. There's still big hunger here, so it's like eclipse of the food, call it that. I don't know if you share my view, um, uh, uh, Judith. Um, and this one's still also from the Guardian newspaper for the 4th, um, or rather for the 10th. And it is talking about, if you notice the red hats there, I'm not going to tell you exactly who it might be referring to, but it's talking about the governor um, sponsoring, uh, the governor of Imo State sponsoring pilgrims, Christian pilgrims to Jerusalem, and also noting that this time not just the elite can actually travel, can be benefits, uh, beneficiaries, but even uh, the lower class. Judith, are you looking forward to perhaps going on a pilgrimage sometime soon? Uh, I think this is at this point I would decide to plead the fifth in this matter. You know, I'm not, you know, uh, apparently it's free and we can both afford it now. We can both go if we want to. Yeah, can you afford a, a, a cruise? I would like a cruise. Okay? Not a cruise. It's, this, see, I like a cruise. The Christian pilgrimage. No, Judith. no, no. I would want to survive the uncertain economy uh, situation <laughs> or need. So uh, a, a cruise, a vacation away, not a pilgrimage to walk around holy sites. Sorry. Yeah. Well, here's to everybody out there. If you know any of these trips that you think that might be very good uh, for our show for Saturday, or maybe even tomorrow, or maybe next week, do send it in. We'll let you know exactly how you can send that in by giving you the details. In fact, you can find them here on the screen. But that's as many as we can take today. We did have plenty more, but we've shut on time, so we can't do that. But we have a very interesting segment coming up. Focus Africa. Let's take a look at the Zuma victory.
um, uh, against the IEC. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that we have uh, someone who will be reaching in from South Africa on that one. So stay tuned. And now we head to South Africa following the recent Zuma victory in South Africa against the IEC. It's time for Focus Africa, and this is the segment where we get to uh, just delve into all of the big stories that unfold across Africa. And this time is no different. South Africa is gearing up for an election, but uh, in the coming or in the last few weeks, uh, there has been, you know, uh, uh, withheld or bars against the former president of the country, and that's Jacob Zuma running uh, for office. But now he seems to have won his petition, and he might be running for office. And so to give us a bit of insight on this recent development uh, leading up to South Africa's election. We're going to be joined uh, very shortly, uh, uh, very soon. I'm going to let Mizuno do the introductions. For yes, our indeed. Guests. Thank you very much, Judith. We have joining us uh, from South Africa, Professor Sifo Siepe. You are welcome, sir. Good to have you here, sir. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, good. So we have a couple of questions. If you can intimate us with the uh, instances happening in South Africa regarding the Jacob Zuma uh, court case, which was won uh, against the IEC, um, what particular instance, what particular uh, uh, um, nuance gave him that victory? Well, um, first one must go back to why he was part in the first place. Um, a few, about last two years ago, uh, the former president was found guilty of contempt of court. Mm -hmm. And one must understand that this is not a, a criminal case, mm -hmm. but it is a civil case. But the Concord of South Africa decided to sentence him to prison without the benefit of a trial. And the IEC uh, has a clear stipulation that it was lying on in making sure that it does not uh, run. The stipulation is in the constitution that says Anybody who has been sentenced to uh, 12 months or more without an option of a fine cannot be uh, elected into the National Assembly. But the people have raised the issue that uh, Jacob Zuma was never afforded an opportunity to go on a trial because the very same section of the Constitution says nobody can consider to be sentenced unless the person has uh, had the right or a exhausted all the right to appeals, both for the conviction as well as the sentence. So here we find that the constitutional court had uh, almost misdirected itself and uh, in so doing misdirected the electoral commission, which then decided that just because Jacob Zuma was sentenced by uh, for 15 months, he mm -hmm. is not eligible. And the, the people representing Jacob Zuma and the MK party went to the higher court, the electoral court, which uh, upon looking at the merits of the case, decided to, to overturn the decision of the independent electoral commission. So as matters stand, the position is Jacob Zuma uh, is eligible to be to vote and also to be voted for in the public office. Mm. But the IEC has also done something else. It has decided to say, it will need to approach the court again to seek mm -hmm. clarity because uh, it finds itself very confused because uh, the section of the constitution is very clear. Mm -hmm. But what they have not done is to read the other section of the same clause that says no one can be considered to have been sentenced unless they have exercised the right to appeal. Okay. And that right was denied Jacob Zuma. So this is where the conundrum is. Okay, so he was initially sentenced to 15 months in jail, but he only served about three months. He was forgiven, yes. uh, in quote, by the uh, president, uh, president that's uh, Ramaphosa, and that was the implication that actually gives him the advantage currently. Am I correct? Can you explain that's in correct. detail? That's correct. That, that is a position that the lawyers of the president are saying. Mm -hmm. They're saying because he, his sentence uh, enjoyed a remission and he served only three months, that clause is no longer applicable. But they've also raised another argument that says the Bill of Rights, which supersedes all other clauses, uh, is the one that says everyone has a right to vote, but also has a right to present themselves to be voted into public office. And they, given that the Bill of Rights says that, they say all other clauses must be subordinate to that. Mm. And the, the electoral court has not come back to us to give us the reasons. 
but they are satisfied based on the arguments on both sides that the President Zuma qualifies to be elected into office. Okay. Professor, we, we understand that there's been this you know, ruling has sparked a lot of debate uh, across the populace and as well as political analysts and analysts who are watching the story. And they have sort of you know, put um, a, a, a veil on, on the integrity of the electoral process and even the body as well, uh, giving Zuma's uh, uh, tainted uh, 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 reputation. What would you say to this? Uh, what are the arguments like the debates have been? And uh, what is the situation in South Africa in terms of South Africans and, and going to the polls? Well, the, the former president is a, a person who enjoys support, but at the same time, you have people that dislike him intensely. So when you have a, a person who evokes such emotions, it's understandable that anything that happens to him will invite a, a lot of debate. But what is very clear for most people is that uh, the former president was sentenced by the highest court in the land without the benefit of a trial. So what we have here is the highest court in the land bringing one of the most repressive measures of a party where you detain people without uh, a trial. So that is the issue that uh, makes people to be very upset. Mm -hmm. One must also remember that uh, because of that, we had the July 2021 riots where over 350 people died because of the decision. People protesting to say we cannot have fought against apartheid and have apartheid being brought back by our own constitutional court judges. So one must understand that context to understand the emotion. And those who hate Jacob Zuma, they don't care whether his rights are violated or not. So the position right now is that this matter will probably go back to the constitutional court to be clarified as the IEC says, you are the one who sentenced him. Mm -hmm. uh, how are we to understand this? And how are we to also to understand the president's uh, remission okay. of the sentence? Okay. Uh, let's talk about Jacob Zuma's popularity, especially in KwaZulu-Natal. With important. the elections coming through, what are his chances? Well, there's no doubt that the uh, Umkoto Sizwe party uh, is enjoying a lot of support in case of 10. And, uh, and as people put it now, that uh, it is probably the most uh, popular party. And mm -hmm. that actually says something about this person who's presented as retainted. Why would people love him so much, even when he's out of power? And it is not only in Kwazu Natal where he enjoys support. He also enjoys support in Gauteng and mm -hmm. in Pomalanga. It is four provinces in this country. Uh, we've seen the MK party growing. And it seems to be going from strength to strength. So it uh, challenges this notion mm -hmm. that this is a person that is actually hated. What you have is that uh, the so-called clever blacks, the so-called middle class, who are beneficiaries of the current administration, are the ones who hate them and they control the media. And the mainstream, mainstream media wants people to believe that this is a person who is hated. But uh, what is now clear is that uh, the growth of MK party Mm -hmm. And the support that he enjoys is creating problems for the ruling party and those who control the ruling party. And you're welcome to Creative Corner, where we celebrate the boundless creativity of artists around the world and most importantly, Africa. And today we have the pleasure of speaking with Anthony Azikwo. He's a co contemporary artist, an author and entrepreneur, and is based in Lagos, Nigeria. His work primarily focuses on Africa folklore and mythology, using these themes and figures to tell stories of his country, transformation and change. Anthony. You're welcome, and we're so thrilled to have you. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. Thank I you. love what you're doing. First yeah. off, it's modern art, and yeah. then it's, yeah, well, legends from your uh, origin. Yeah. What, why exactly? How did you marry those two, first off? Um, I think it started for a while. I've been writing for about, like, what, maybe 10 years oh, now. Oh, you write as well? Yes, I'm an author as well, so I've written a couple books. And I think um, when the opportunity came to start learning like a new skill, it really just became a very seamless transition. Mm -hmm. So from then on, I've done like, you know, a couple of stuff, you know, contemporary paintings of, I would say, just stories that I'm originating myself, inspired by maybe like mythology and like folklore, and maybe just stories I've heard. And also, you know, also about like Nigeria and our current like situation. Mm -hmm. So I feel 
with art is really like a good medium to really express myself. Mm. Yeah, but what really inspired you to pursue uh, visual art in particular? Um, nothing much. I would lie. Like my laptop broke one day, and then <laughs> like I can't. Like my handwriting is really bad, so mm. I really needed to express myself somehow. And at the time, um, I would say that um, you know canvases, papers, pens, these are really expensive. Mm -hmm. But then I would say that like it was easier to just like steal my sister's mouse and like just teach myself how to draw on that. Oh, hang on a second. You mean you actually draw digitally? Yeah, so I draw digitally. So yeah, that's like basically how it's done. So, so it's, it's like, it's kind of like the same as using a pen, only this exactly time it's like a mouse. Exactly the same. Uh, yeah. so, so do you find that being able to draw, If because I can draw, for instance, are you mm. saying that I can use a mouse and I can... No, he yeah. cannot. He's lying. Yeah, oh, should, come on, no, Judith. For sure, you should be able to. To surprise her, I also write. <laughs> yeah, he does. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but so it's, it's easy to make that transition from paper to... Yeah, so I mean, I didn't really learn that much with paper, so I started learning a lot with digital. So I started with okay. like a mouse, and then I did like a commission, and then I got enough money to do with like a tablet. Oh. Okay. Then from then on, it would just like start that cycle of, you know, maybe I get like this nice commission, then I put the money into getting better tools, better tools, I can do better work. You make money from it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sign me up. <laughs> what do I need to do? Uh, uh, Anthony, your work is incredibly distinct, right? When you see it, you can almost, you mm. can tell right away that that's Anthony. And it makes me wonder about your creative process as well. Okay. Um, how do you approach a new piece? What goes into your mind when you are starting up in terms of a creative journey? Yeah, I feel like a good example is the new um, Young John piece because he, we did two covers this year. The first one was for Big Big Things, and like we had talked about it for like a couple weeks and months. And I was thinking, okay, how do we approach this? Because we're doing like album artwork, for instance. You're trying to find a way to a connect this piece of visual work to like the music, but also b be able to tell a story that's like interesting. And I feel like from then I was in the shower one day and I thought about okay. This is an individual who's been able to transition, you know, he's been able to embody change from being a producer to an artist, okay, mm -hmm. change, metamorphosis, how do we get that into a painting, you know, or a sculpture? So the first one was a sculpture, and then the second one um, for his album, that was a painting. So I'll say that it's a very, like, loose process where I'm thinking about it for a couple of days, and sometimes I can, like, kind of paint and, like, you know, experiment with colors on my own end, mm -hmm. and then maybe one day it kind of clicks, and I'm like, okay, look, this is the idea. So I would say that it's like a very like slow gradual process and then it happens all at once. Then from there I start sketching, then I start layering like, because again it's very similar to like traditional. So I'm layering like paint and like pigments and it just works from there. That Young John piece, could you tell us more about that? Oh yeah, it was really, really fun to work on. Um, we finished it maybe earlier this month or like last month, you know. Uh, alongside Young John, is that what you're doing? Huh? Was Young John, it, 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 uh, uh, you did this in collaboration with Young John? Yeah, so it's for his album. For his album, for his album, album just came cover. Out yesterday, yeah. Wow. Yeah, nice. so that was like really fun to you work on. You do make money from it. Yeah. He well, said he did. <laughs> well, I thought he just, you know, I'm being modest. Being modest. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you went money, money. Money, oh, money. Okay. Yeah, yeah, Not so in Nigeria, like yeah, man. Like money, money. Yeah, money. Yeah, Dollar. So it, it's something like that. I feel like it's very interesting because with music, you know, there's a loss that can happen, you know, and it, it's like one of those things where, that's how a lot of modern people also interact with art as well. Right. Because some people have seen a lot of paintings and stuff, and it's like, yes, for the album, but then it's really interesting to be able to interact with that, you know, via your favorite artist, for instance. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it was really cool to work on. I, your work has, you've, you've, you've toured, what, London, Lagos, New York? Yeah, so you, last year was a busy year. And you've wow. been very busy all through of last year, right? And what was it like seeing other people or, like, other besides Nigerian or of African descent who are out there, you know, intimating their, themselves with your work. What was that feeling like? And what did you hope that they took away from that? And what was, the, what was it yeah. like just seeing it? I think it was definitely um, surprising, you know, to be recognized across like these many cities, um, especially like New York. I hadn't been there in a long, long time. So I think it was, you know, interesting to be back and like doing things and have that recognition. I think for me, the main thing, you know, that I want anybody to take away from it is just like, you know, I would say Africa globally, there are lots of stories out there that are not like necessarily positive. Mm -hmm. And I feel like being able to present my own story and my own work and present like another side to this, you know, with culture and art, like it's really important to show people that there's more than what they're seeing. Right. Mm -hmm. And how do they embrace uh, um, your form of art back home here? That's another question because you might be representing it in a different form. Like if you talk about folklore here in Nigeria, yeah. you have calabash, tree, buckets, yeah. red, red cloth. Did you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In your eyes, it might be art, and then you 
translate or you, you uh, what's the word, interpret it in your own form digitally. So how is that digital representation accepted here in Nigeria? Mm -hmm. Yes, I said that that's like, there's like two levels to that. There's now like one, the themes of the work. So let's say to a particular generation, like my mom, she doesn't like some of the work because it's mm -hmm. like, to her, like, that look is very, can be very dark. And like that generation, yeah. they see it and they're like, yeah, you know, I don't know. Yeah. But for us, it's like, okay, this is nice, this is cool. But then the second thing is now with digital work itself. You know, for a while, I would say that curators and galleries weren't really like, I would say, sending because this is something that they couldn't quite understand. And I feel like it was something that just took a while. You know, we had, I've had curators tell me that, yeah, if you're not really painting with brushes, mm -hmm. this isn't going to fly. But then, you know, I did my own shows. We did our own tours. And sooner or later, like, people kind of understood that, oh, yeah, this is the same. Like what you just recognized, this is the same art, it's the same painting, it's mm -hmm. just a different medium. It's what I would say, like, the consciousness is right now. Fantastic. Anthony, well done. Yeah, well done. You. I look forward to so much more. We're just entering the yes, second mm -hmm. quarter, and I'm certain that there's yeah, more of your sleep. Sure. Look at what you achieved in the first quarter, mm -hmm. and I, I do hope to see more. And we hope to have you back on oh, this time sure. earlier. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Grand. Now, this might be the end of the show. For today, however, we still have three more hours. Not today. <laughs> <laughs> that will be tomorrow. I'm looking forward to tomorrow's show because tomorrow marks the 30 years after the Rwandan genocide. And we'll be talking about that with a special correspondent from Rwanda. So if you join us, you get to find out about it. I'm sure you're excited about this oh, as well. I am as well because not only are we going to be talking about uh, Rwanda's genocide 30th anniversary, but we'll also be focusing on uh, the, our weekend warrior, and that's Belumi Nubi. Uh, she, I had a sit down with her earlier this week when she came into our studios, and it was a lovely chat. She's such an interview's delight, Mazino. Oh. I loved talking to her. I, I saw I, you too. Yeah, it was so much fun. So I cannot wait to share that journey. She shared her journey with me, and I, yes, I can't indeed. wait for our viewers to see it as well come tomorrow we wow. also will be talking raising awareness about parkinson's disease yes indeed. it's a uh, very very important very and good thursday, sunday package yes and thursday was a uh, world parkinson's day yeah. and so we're having a guest from uh, a foundation as well as a person who is living who leaves the disease to shed more light about it well, thank you guys very much. Unlike, uh, what do they call that show during the week? Breakfast? I'm <laughs> back at you. <laughs> we drink from our cups. <laughs> Goodbye. Catch you guys tomorrow. Good night, guys. <laughs>